Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Our guest needs no introduction. It's Dr. Melody Diyahar. For those of you who haven't attended any of her talks before, you're in for a treat. And what I will do after the webinar, I will share the links to her previous webinars, but you can also find them on our website, which is www.lvcol. Dot co dot za and just click on previous webinars. We have 97 previously recorded webinars on all aspects of vision. Dr. Melody Diyahar and I have done a lot of work together with people who are visually impaired. I met her probably about 15 years ago, I think. We've looked a lot at primitive reflexes and how to help people. So Melody's following up on the talk that we had by Dr. Josh Matson two weeks ago. So Melody, without further ado, please introduce yourself and Karen will take questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Belinda, Hazel and Karen. And good evening, good afternoon. Wherever you are, I hope you're nice and warm. So I thought, let's start a little bit philosophically in this afternoon with this beautiful, beautiful saying that when you get unnerved by the wildness of the world as we know it, don't look for safety in institutions, it's no longer there. Instead, look at your life, your history, your passions, the direction of your interests. Then ask yourself over and over what your ancestors ask each other on a million different trials. What do you see? So we're going to talk about vision and ocular stability, but we're going to talk mostly about um, the vestibular system, the feet, and somehow gravity is coming into the mix. So when we look at life, what do we see? We see beautiful babies are born every single day. We see children reading. We see people happy in the working environment and in families. We see senior adults walking, being healthy, and being incredibly happy. Pardon me if I didn't show you pictures of the opposite, because increasingly people are experiencing difficulty with childbirth. More and more children are battling to read in South Africa. The recent polls results indicated that 82% of our 10-year-old children can't read for meaning. So when we look at adults, relationships are strained, it seems, and people are, are suffering from stress in the workplace. And there's an increasing number of, of the elderly who are also really battling with quality of life. Well, I don't think it's something new. We've always, um, as we age, battled a little bit with quality of life, but it seems to be on the increase, but it may also be because there are more people who are retiring now than they have been ever before. So I'm associated with the Mindfulness Institute. At Mindfulness Institute, we focus on developmental neurology from an educational perspective. So we look at pregnancy, we look at early infant development, we look at the development preschool, during school years, working adults and into senior years. And we, we follow the basic principles of biomimicry where we look towards nature for solutions about challenges. So most of the challenges I mentioned just now is somehow related to learning. And for this afternoon, I'm going to define learning as the ability to adapt. And that ability to adapt is right through our lives because that baby that's in utero needs to adapt to the world outside of utero. That baby that's crawling on the floor needs to adapt and get upright and join the human race as a, as a homo sapiens. The, a, a preschooler needs to adapt from the world of play and three-dimensional concrete objects to symbols and writing and reading. And so as adults have to, to really adapt to challenging working with the environment on a daily basis. So the ability to adapt also reaches into our senior years when we need to learn to adapt to retirement and to the changes of our body. So at the Mindness Institute, we look at all these different opportunities that we need to learn to adapt. And even though the context 
and the content might differ a lot. What we've been looking for is what is the driving system that runs right through life? Because, you know, Occam's razor, if there's a simple solution to something, let us find that. And it's not new. But what we all need to do is to take whatever is out there and somehow bring it in here. And when whatever is out there is brought in here, it enables us to adjust if we want to, and therefore live with greater ease. So what is out there? If we look at the physicists, they tell us out there, everything in essence is vibration. Every single something out there has something to do with vibration that needs to be converted via our senses into electrical impulses that can run to the brain, that can flow through the brain, where we can make sense of our environment. The physicist also tells us that gravity seems to be the force that holds all those vibrations together. So gravity is fundamental to our development, our survival, and our ability to thrive. So when we take what is out there, through our senses, and in this picture you'll only see five senses, our sense of touch, our sense of smell, our sense of taste, our sense of hearing, and our sense of sight. But obviously, our sense, not of moving, but our sense of movement, which includes proprioception, um, vestibular system, and kinesis, that's not indicated in this picture, but obviously, that's part of our sensory systems that enables us to convert information from out there into the vibrations, the stimuli in vibrational form, into um, electrical impulses that our brain can process. What I found fascinating was when I double checked that um, our sense of smell and taste are also vibrational, that stimuli is vibrational in, in essence, and, and it, it really is. So we need to take vibrations, into in via our senses, we need to convert it into electrical impulses. And this sounds like a very automatic process, which is not exactly how it works. And that's what we're going to talk about because sometimes it happens that that natural conversion doesn't take place so naturally. So we're going to talk about the driving force behind this gradual development of the neurological system that enable us to convert information and enable us to operate, first of all, to survive, and then in time to thrive. So survival is always brainstem related, where thriving is closer to the cortex and our ability to think. Well, it's not just our ability to think that it's important. Um, at the Magnus Institute, we've had this amazing opportunity to learn and collaborate with a team of neurologists under the leadership of Oleg Efimov and um, his wife, Victoria Efimova, which is a speech therapist, and myself, and a 120 um, strong um, therapist group, of which quite a few were neurologists. And we look at the role of the vestibular system, specifically in terms of that conversion process of its, um, vibrational information into electrical information. And Oleg was very adamant that the vestibular system is the place in the body where gravity meets cognition. I argued that quite a bit because I thought that's really, really, I'm not sure about that. And it took us quite a few conversations and a lot of research. And I am, con I am convinced he actually nailed it. So the vestibular system is the place in the body where gravity meets cognition. So gravity... Um, the physicist says in the strive for a theory for everything, it hangs very closely with gravity. So gravity is a non-negotiable. And we'll talk more and more why is our awareness and, and our ability to process information from gravity so fundamental to physical, emotional, social, and cognitive well-being. So thank you to Alec. Um, we've got a bit of extra information. So we spoke briefly about the senses. We spoke briefly about cognition, because another thing that research 
has confirmed in our co collaboration with Oleg and his team was that there's very diff little difference between your ability to move and your ability to think. Now, neuroscientist Daniel Volpert says we have a brain for one reason, one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. So he calls himself a movement chauvinist. But what he says is really true. He says movement is the only way you can affect the world. Well, then he cracks a joke and he says, well, you can affect the world through sweating. And there's not movement involved with sweating. He said, but that's the only other way that you can really impact on the world. So the ability to move depends on our ability to understand, make sense, cognitively make sense of our environment. And our ability to make cognitive sense of our environment is hugely influenced by the role of the vestibular system. And the vestibular system can't ever work in isolation. It relies on the sense of touch, the sense of smell, the sense of taste, the sense of hearing and sight. And in that sequence, we believe at the Mindfulness Institute, based on infant development, um, so movement can only take place if the substructures or the subsystems are in place. If we want the, our marvelous eyes to be able to make sense of what is going on in our environment, research has shown the brain needs awareness of the feet to be able to process information. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more. And the moment the brain knows where the feet are, it automatically creates stability. First of all, of the head. Well, head stability um, develops before there's awareness of the, the feet, and I'll get into that a little bit more just now. But if we want to talk about ocular stability, we cannot look at ocular stability without first looking at the gross stability of the head, of the whole body, and with that, comes the feet. So gravity acts as a reference point for building a, a frame of reference. So it gives us coordination, but it gives us a frame of reference, a current location. And the moment your GPS can pick up your current location, thank you heavens for the latest GPS. Can you remember there was a time when you had to enter your current location? And if you were lost, how do you enter your current location if you lost? But you see, that's in a way how the, the vestibular system and gravity works together to give us a sense of direction, to give us a sense of current location from where we can move um, into our environment and interact. And that stability is always, as I said, first the head, then the body, and only then do we get to ocular st um, stability. So gravity is constant acceleration. I must admit, I really battled with that initially because what does constant um, acceleration means? Now, the whole picture that you're seeing at the moment, if you remove the earth, which is the ball right in the middle, if you can just lift it off that grid, the grid will be level. So the way the physicists explain gravity is, is the earth is in the grid, which is like a heavy, like you take a heavy ball but a metal ball and you put it on a mattress, they would automatically be a dead. And with that, constant acceleration means we are actually constantly falling. And if we are constantly falling, it means it's, we are constantly in a downward spool towards, towards gravity. And that's why Jean S says our first relationship is actually with gravity and not our mass. Because gravity is, is exactly where we naturally gravitate towards. Um, and that's why when we lie down, when we tire, when we jet lag, jet lag, or when we've just had a hard day, what is more comforting than lying down? Because we are less in performance mode. Because when we lie down, our whole sensory system, especially our tactile system, and the um, receptors in our skin picks up where we are in space. But the moment we want to move, because as Daniel Wolpert says, it's great to lie down, 
but we're not going to impact on the world. We can't relieve any of the suffering. We can't have fun. We can't love. We can't hug if we don't move. And that is always in an up, upward position. So gravity pulls downwards, but muscle tone is an opposing force to gravity. So we want to talk about ocular stability. And for ocular stability, we definitely need some muscle movement, but that would be fine muscle movement. So I'm going to focus on the gross muscle movement for now. But whether it's gross or fine muscle movement, you need muscle tone. And please can I use the word muscle tone um, in the broader sense for the, the purposes of this talk. So um, gravity pulls downwards and muscle tone is an opposing force. So that's an upward, it's away from. And for that, we need our vestibular system to plug in and be effective because it's in the vestibular system that we process information from gravity. But if that system is not working optimally, well, obviously, it would be very difficult to process information about gravity. And if you lack a current location, it practices any form of movement would be affected. That means speech. That means gross motor movement. Of course, that means fine motor movement, but it also um, alludes to difficulty with speech. It also difficulty with eye movements and eye stability. You see, the thing is, we are not born with um, fully developed muscle tone because while that baby was in utero, that baby was buffered from the effect of um, gravity. Well, partially not in, in full, but that baby was floating, wasn't it? Right in the beginning, it was floating in amniotic fluid. So it can move reflexively and it can just float. So there was constant passive movement. There was active movement in terms of reflex actions in utero because the primitive, the intrauterine and primitive reflexes fire right from around about five weeks after conception. And it's while that baby is growing in utero, that baby is moving with mom. That's why bed rest has such a negative influence on the development of an infant's um, vestibular system. So when baby is moving with mom, it's marvelous as she moves through the real day because she would cross all our midlands forwards, backwards, up, down, and left, right, and so with the baby as well. But as the, um, pregnancy progresses, the, the scales are tipping towards baby's mass, so the amniotic fluid stays, stays constant. But as the baby is maturing and obviously growing, that baby, um, the, the relationship between the, um, amniotic fluid and the mass of the baby tips towards mass, and therefore, there's less fluid, and when there's less fluid, amniotic, um, there's less fluid covering the baby, the, the gravity starts exerting a greater influence on the baby's development. And there's a lot of research that points to the role of, of gravity to enable the baby to rotate in a head down position in readiness for a physiological birth. So when a baby fails to turn, there may be other reasons as well. But one of the reasons why a baby may be in bridge position may be because it, there's an e early indication that the infant's vestibular system has not developed sufficiently for age at that stage. And what I find fascinating is that the vestibular system is the only sensory system that's myelinated at birth. Isn't that marvelous? Because the vestibular system is seriously needed to enable that baby to navigate the birth canal for a physiological birth. And there's some thinking that the duration of a physiological birth is slower than a cesarean birth, for example. And Part of the value of the slowness of that um, um, the physiological labor and the birth is that it enables the baby's vestibular system to adjust rather rapidly, as well as all the other senses, to the new conditions outside of the, the womb. Well, at first, just the lack of, of amniotic fluid, 
And then as the baby moves down, gradually moves down the birth canal, that adjustment, so when the baby is born, the baby is not overwhelmed with all the sensory information. So that's why skin on skin is so incredibly important. You may ask, what has this got to do with visual st ocular stability? Well, it's very clear. There's a history. And it takes many years. It takes very long for the eyes to fully develop. And research indicates around about seven years before the eyes are really ready to, to work on a flat surface and therefore to write and read with greater ease. So we need to look at the development. So if there's a hiccup with ocular stability, we need to go check history because we are a product of history. And what I find fascinating about this beautiful picture is can you see how those eyes are staring? No, we can't see the mom at the moment. But I cannot imagine that she's on her phone at the moment. I am positive. They are making eye contact because that is so fundamental in terms of attachment. So when it comes to the development of muscle tone, and remember we said muscle tone is an upwards pull and as an opposing force to the downwards pull of gravity. And nature endows us, every baby, with a set of reflexes. There are many different kinds of reflexes. There are intrauterine reflexes, like the withdrawal reflex, that triggers in utero around about five to seven weeks after conception, but the, to sensitize the skin. So if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see there's a pillar that is going to show you the sequential development of the sensory system. And on the right-hand side, from top to bottom, because that's the direction of muscular development, is from top to bottom, you'll see this dance that nature endows all of us and all our babies in terms of the support of what we at the Institute calls the unseen parent, which is the reflex system. So the withdrawal reflex is tasked with sensitizing the skin. And with that, it automatically starts affecting the neck. Okay, because development is from top to bottom, right? Cephalocaudal. So, but the withdrawal reflex is an intrauterine reflex. It needs to go to rest before a baby is born. Otherwise, the baby may resist birth and the baby may resist feeding. And the baby will obviously first resist latching and then feeding. So, Nature has endowed the baby with intrauterine reflexes. And let's just define a reflex quickly. Reflex is an automatic stereotype. It's fast. It's automatic and it's stereotype. It's the same kind of movement. Um, plugging in the a specific sensory system to specific part of the brain using very specific muscles. So this enables very strong connections, the sensitization of a sensory system. That sensory, once the skin is sensitive in utero, even though there's that white covering that enables the baby to stay warm and for the skin not to disintegrate in utero, the skin is sensitized because it's covered by hair. And every time the amniotic fluid moves, or something moves against the baby, the baby senses that, and that immediately stimulates an instinctive withdrawal. And that's how the senses, the brain, and the muscles start working together to organize the cortex. So the purpose of reflexes, from intrauterine and primitive reflexes, is actually to organize the brain, to organize the functions of the brain. So when that withdrawal reflex has emerged, that baby is constantly getting a bit of a fright. But in time, the baby starts responding. And I'll get to the responding just now. Let's just think of the next reflex. So the withdrawal reflex between five to seven weeks after conception, when it emerges and it runs. It runs till just before birth to sensitize the entire skin, as I said. 
And at the same time, for the baby to draw a map, to create a mental map of the entire body so they can start becoming aware of the physical body. But it's when the moral reflex um, triggers, and that's around about nine weeks of the conception. When the moral reflex triggers, it's because the baby is now the infant that that's the, at that stage is now looking like a human being. Between five and, and eight weeks in utero, the baby looks more like a bean with a little bit of protrusions. And then around about nine weeks, there's defined arms and legs, hands and feet are clear, there's a neck. And what happens with the morrow reflex? It immediately creates that startle reaction that's always led by a head movement, backwards and forwards. So that in turn creates total uh, muscle tone through the entire body from top to bottom and from inside out, all the way to the extremities. So can you see the, the development sensory upwards on the left, motor downwards on the right? And the links to the brain is not 100%, it's a model. It's not 100%, please don't see that as 100% um, anatomically correct. It's just a functional model. So what I find fascinating about, about nature is every time a vestibular reflex is activated, it automatically creates a sense of anxiety. But it's always followed by a soothing reflex, a soothing primitive reflex. So the rooting and sucking reflex follows after the moral reflex. So the moral reflex jump starts the entire nervous system and then the rooting and sucking reflex is tasked with calming the nervous system. Isn't that beautiful? So that internal parent is really doing a marvelous job. And that also stimulates the um, a muscle tone of the, of the core muscles. And you can only do that when the um, limbs are moving. And then once the baby is calm, so the rooting and sucking, you may have seen in scans that when a baby's hand moves close to the mouth, they even start sucking their thumb. Some people see a baby holding on the umbilical cord. And when they hold onto the, it's not like they're squashing it. They can't, they haven't got, they're lacking the muscle tone because you need gravity to build muscle tone. And it's not a gravity free environment in utero, but it's less gravity than in real life. So the moment the baby is soothed, so they are sucking, they are practicing how to, to use their mouth to suck, to seek, and it's practicing how to swallow. Baby is swallowing a lot of amniotic fluid while in utero, they don't choke and they can't suffocate because that's not how they breathe in utero, but you're aware of that. So the moment they've been calm for a bit, so obviously these constant mom moves all of a sudden, there's a startle reaction, and invariably now the baby now has to self-soothe, and they would tend to use sucking and the tongue on the palate to self-soothe. It's not a conscious decision. That's the purpose of a primitive reflex. It's instinctive. And then the tonic labyrinth, which is the second of primitive reflexes to trigger, it, it's tasked with, with developing sensitizing hearing. And that's why it's around about 16 weeks after conception, it tends to start triggering. And the tonic labyrinth is triggered when the baby moves its head to the back, the body extends, and there's still space in utero at that stage for the baby to arch backwards. And when the head drops, the baby flexes forward. So this is the whole forward backwards movement while the morrow is more a, a complete backwards forward. The tonic labyrinth is a, it's a flexing and extending as though it's developing the midline between the top part of the body and the bottom part of the body. The top part of the brain, the cortex, and the bottom, which is the limbic system, where the morrow reflex tends to cross the midline between the sensory back brain and the motor front brain. What did we say about nature? The moment there's a vestibular reflex activated. So the tonic labyrinth reflex is a vestibular primitive reflex as, as well as the auditory 
and primitive reflex. There are others as well, but at the Mindmuse Institute, we find that these reflexes that we are um, alluding to at the moment are triggering in a very specific sequence as observed um, in utero. It's exactly how you see them emerge in utero. And we've just associated with a specific sensory system and muscle movement to enable the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, peripheral nervous system, sensory input and motor output that obviously has to flow to the brain, from the brain and out to the muscles. And finally, we get to the ATNR, which is generally um, viewed as one of the most important primitive reflexes that affects learning. And it's absolutely correct. The ATNR is probably the reflex that is mostly responsible for challenges on an academic level, especially when it comes to writing and reading, because the ATNR is tasked at integrating all the previous nervous um, sensory systems and muscular systems that's been developed, and then it adds the eyes. And remember, in utero, there's very little to see. So there's very little visual stimulation in utero. And therefore, the eyes are the last. And I'll show you a slide with that later on. The eyes are the last of the senses to develop, but the eyes are also the last of the muscles to develop. And for that reason, ocular stability relies 100% Okay, let's make it 90% on the substructures of previous primitive reflexes. And I, I think what we find helpful at the Mindfulness Institute is to think of primitive reflexes not as something that we want to get rid of. We love them because they've got a very, they task with a very specific developmental task. And once they've been, because they stereotype repeat movements, they've repeated the same movement often enough. Those networks become myelinated and then they integrate. They go to rest. They don't die off. We don't want to suppress them. We want those primitive reflexes to fulfill this developmental function. And once they've, they've triggered enough times and they've run those pathways enough times, connecting the senses to specific regions in the brain to organize the brain, and then for the brain to use and gain increasingly control over the muscles that are associated with that sensory motor system. As those pathways have been repeated, they myelinate, and as you know about myelination, the moment something is myelinated, it becomes saved in a way, it's saved for future use. So now the brain, and always remember, uh, primitive reflexes, intrauterine and primitive reflexes, uh, they all originate from the brainstem. So as long as a primitive reflex is active, it's still building its pathway. It somehow says, I haven't repeated this pattern enough times to be myelinated. So I still need to stick to my, my task and complete this pathway. So one can integrate or a baby can, for example, um, develop optimally. The reflexes, primitive reflexes may have done their job perfectly or optimally as well. They myelinated their pathways and that's why they've gone to rest. So the cortex, can now start using those pathways to develop skills. So can you hear? Primitive reflexes are not something we want to get rid of. They are friends. But when they persist or when they were integrated, but they re-emerge at a later stage, you can know that there's a pathway, the pathway that that particular reflex was responsible for has been injured. And that can be due to to allergies that can be due to injury. It's also said that it can be due to emotional stress and trauma. So when a 
primitive reflex re-emerges at a later stage. It's not a negative thing. It's the brain doing its optimal task of repairing itself, repairing the pathways, so it, that reflex can integrate once it's repeated and repaired its pathway, so that pathway is myelinated, it can go to rest, which then frees that pathway to be used by the cortex for more advanced skills. Nature, phenomenal. So we can actually say that infant development is mankind's systematic struggle to overcome gravity. So you've got primitive re intrauterine reflexes that needs to go to rest before birth. Otherwise, it may delay or impact negatively on birth. We have primitive reflexes that emerges in utero, but they carry over because it helps the baby to develop in utero. It assists with birth, and then it enables the baby to develop further in a full gravity-rich environment. So remember, gravity always pulls down. So where's our safe place? When we lie down. But if you lie down, you know it's not going to develop. You are not going to be able to impact on the world. And therefore, you're not going to be able to adapt and therefore learn. So infant development is a gradual and systematic struggle to overcome gravity. That's why a baby is rolling over. What do they start with? That safe place, skin on skin on a mom's chest, while they're breastfeeding is a marvelous opportunity for the, for the baby to learn to turn their head. If you've observed a baby, a, a young baby, learning to feed, they initially hit the breast with their head, and then there's all kinds of head movement, which is brilliant to stimulate the vestibular system because the vestibular system, the central vestibular system, is in the neck area to the left and the right of the brain stem, and, and the peripheral vestibular system is in the inner ear. So every head movement, you can't move the head without affecting the, the neck, and you can't move the head without affecting the, the peripheral vestibular system in both ears. So can you see while that baby is lying in the safety of the mom's body or on the safety, within the safety sphere of the mom's body where they feel the, the warmth, where they feel the touch, where they smell and taste mom's, because they used to mom smell and taste from living in mom's body for the last nine months, more or less. That enables that baby to relax. It brings balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. It calms down the nervous system. Baby feels safe and secure. And now, increasingly, baby wants to explore. And that's when they start um, gaining the first motor milestone is feeding. The second motor milestone is head control. Head control is followed by rolling over to the left and to the right. But for that reason, the baby needs to spend time with gravity flat on the ground because if the baby doesn't spend time, enough time flat on the ground, they need to bond with gravity before they can develop something that Jean is coined called gravitational security. They need to be secure in knowing gravity will always pull them down. It's not a cognitive thought. It's an experience they know. When I lie down, I'm safe. So they build a positive relationship with gravity. And then gradually, gradually, they start rolling over. So now they start pulling parts of their body in an opposing direction to the pull of gravity, and that's how they increasingly develop their muscle tone. And then in time, they've rolled over to the left and to the right enough, their core muscles are stronger. By then, the eye muscles are developing as well, and vision becomes a little bit more clear. You know, initially, a baby is protected from seeing too far, so they're not overwhelmed. And as their vision clears, the baby starts seeing further, and what do they want to do? They want to interact with what they're seeing, and that's why they start moving, pushing up. Tummy time, 
resulting in that pushing up, which in time with rolling moves into a sitting position. That's a marvelous milestone because now they're upright against the pull of gravity. It's a huge accomplishment. And it cannot happen without proprioceptors in the body, um, without the um, maturation of the vestibular system, and without that curiosity, innate curiosity, to want to do like they see other people do. And then once they're in a crawling position, what happens? They start reaching out because they want to participate. They want to hold what you hold. And what happens? That naturally means they start leaning over a little bit more. And in time, they move into a crawling position. In the South African context, we talk about leopard crawling as creeping. So when they're flat on the gr ground and they creep like a um, leopard crawl, like a, a soldier, in South Africa, we call that creeping. And when they push themselves up in an all fours position, hands and knees, we call that in South Africa crawling. I know it's the exact opposite in the States, I believe. So when that baby is in a crawling position, do you have any clue? How difficult that is. Do you have any clue what a sense of accomplishment that is and how we need to celebrate and applaud that baby because they're really managing to resist gravity. They're overcoming gravity and when they're in that all force position they are giving gravity a heck of a handle on that body so it develops a muscle tone in the upper body and in their lower body and then they start coordinating crossing that visual midline as the hands move forward and in time they start pulling up, in time they start cruising, every time developing the physical body and a greater level of maturity in terms of the vestibular system and all the other sensory systems that in time enables that baby to find their feet and to start navigating in the environment. Want to point out once again that in terms of sensory lift, bottom up, motor, top to bottom on the right, the eyes, ocular stability, the development of the eyes are the last of the sensory systems to develop and the last of the muscle systems to develop. And that's why I'm spending most of the time this evening on looking at the sequential development of the sensory motor system as a way of maturing and myelinating the base organization of even the cortex and the nervous system, central and peripheral, that will then enable the more advanced paired senses to have a greater influence in terms of the cortex. Let me just explain what I've just said. Um, in simple terms, we've got one skin, We've got one vestibular system. There's a central and a peripheral, but they work in tandem. So it's one vestibular system. We've got one nose and one mouth. So the, the simpler of the senses, it's when we get to the two ears and the two eyes associated with the tonic labyrinth reflex um, forwards and backwards and the AT and R reflex to the left and to the right that we really work with the lateralization of the cortex. So we keep on talking about gravity, but gravity is so embedded in everything that we do that it's only when you're in a relatively gravity-free environment called microgravity that we actually realize the impact of gravity. We've got a very rich research base in NASA, it was within the UK, in Tokyo, in um, Japan, and in Russia. We've learned a tremendous lot from what happens to astronauts, aeronauts, cosmo cosmonauts, whatever they call them in, in each country. But the moment those very intelligent people are up in space, it's often been reported. And Sally Goddard in one of her books said it, that aeronauts often become dyslexic in space. I was ecstatic when I read that sentence because becoming dyslexic in space, but not dyslexic on earth means there's something here 
that we need to really pay attention to before we, we say a child is dyslexic. We need to double check what is that child's vestibular system's relationship with gravity. Because in gravity, the research has shows the eyes are the first to suffer and they may even present dyslexia. Muscle tone is immediately affected as well because there's no gravity that they need to oppose and that's why they're floating around. And I don't know if you're aware, but when space travelers like these come home, they very often have calluses on the top of their feet. Well, if we walk a lot, we get calluses at the bottom of our feet because that's point of contact. But because they're floating in wherever they are traveling at that stage, they have a way of hooking their feet. All kinds of strategic cases, they hook the feet to keep them in one place because the research has indicated that when the brain knows where the feet are, only then can you orientate yourself in space. When the brain does not know where the feet are, it's extremely difficult to orientate yourself in space. And just a practical thing, just for a moment, face the screen as you're doing it at the moment and write a lowercase letter B. I think I wrote the B for your eyes. And notice if you're facing this direction, in which direction does the, the lowercase letter B faces? It will be in a specific direction. Now turn 90 degrees and write a lowercase letter B, but your feet must face in the same direction as your face. So your feet must face in the same direction as your face. And now write the lowercase letter, letter B. And you will notice that that letter B is facing a different direction. Now turn to the other side. Please do this with me. It's a very simple activity, but it really shows us that when our feet are pointing in this direction, it gives us the direction, it guides us in the direction that a letter must face. So when the brain knows where the feet are, one can start orientating yourself in space. So direction and sequence is always influenced by the vestibular system's relationship with gravity because it helps remember the place in the brain where gravity meets cognition is in the vestibular system. So when the vestibular system is faulty or if the vestibular system is not aware of the feet, it's very difficult to orientate in space. It's very difficult to write and read. It's even difficult to speak. So in the field of gravity, human movement is always connected with posture. This lady just unfortunately passed away recently, but she was in her 90s and still actively involved with space travel in Russia. Phenomenal woman. And in her research, she found that there are gravitational receptors in the cells of our feet. Is that there are proprioceptors all over the, the body. They're sometimes called mechanoreceptors. But at the base of our feet, in the ball of the feet, there are gravitational receptors. Those gravitational receptors to speak to the vestibular system, which enables us to orientate ourselves in space. But much more than that, it enables one to feel safe and secure because you know where you are. You know in which direction you're facing. And the moment that happens, it becomes easy to orientate your posture and for you to plan and execute movements. I'm not even talking about ocular stability at the moment because we are, we're talking about a gross level at the moment and not the fine level of the eyes. So every time an infant starts walking, it, it's such a sense of accomplishment. And I don't know if you can see the one foot is solidly intact and reading gravity, that the stevia system is moving optimally. They have, 
develop a sense of balance to such an extent that they can now lift the other leg because they have gravitational security and therefore they can move with confidence against gravity. I'll send you a document with these particular slides that I'm showing you right now. There's an article associated with this as well. And then you can see how the visual skills gradually develop, um, how each of the primitive reflexes in sequence develop a variety of visual skills. Just wanted to point out again, the Mara reflex, the tonic la ra labyrinth reflex, and the ATNR are all three vestibular primitive reflexes. The Mara reflex is the base vestibular um, reflex. The tonic labyrinth elaborates on the, the structure that the Mara reflex has developed and it adds on and so does the ATNR. That goes without saying, if the Mara reflex hasn't completed its developmental function, the others will hook onto an immature system and it will impact on, on development. Later on, there are bridging reflexes, the SDNR, vital in visual development, but it's only vital after the primitive reflexes have emerged, they've developed and structured the brain and the nervous system in totality, and they've repeated their patterns enough times to go to rest so higher skills can start developing. And then ultimately, we want a child when the bridging reflex also inhibits, then we have lifelong postural reactions like the ocular head writing reflex, where when the body moves, the head automatically adjusts to keep the eyes level. So the vestibular system relies on the feet to give it stability, to give it a, a fixed, a stable point of reference, and also stable posture to enable visual development or ocular stability to develop. So when a child battles to go downstairs, up, going up is easy. When they battle to come down, when they're afraid of the dark, when they're clumsy, when they battle with motion sickness, when they're really anxious, because when the vestibular system, all the other sensory systems as well, but the vestibular system particularly, if the vestibular system is not fully developed, anxiety is a natural symptom. And remember, if the vestibular system is not optimally developed, it's very difficult for the brain, for cognition, to develop because those primitive reflexes will hold the child in a primitive brain state because the, the basic wiring is not in place. If schoolwork looks like that, or even if a child is battling with um, cortical visual impairment, one must also check, first of all, and foremost, are any of the other primitive um, reflexes still active, or are any of the sensory systems still overly sensitive or even dormant, because that means they haven't myelinated, they haven't integrated, that will enable the brain to develop optimally, to, um, to organize for the general organization of the brain, which is exactly what the intrauterine and primitive reflexes stimulate. So that's why at the Mindness Institute, we say encourage children, don't discourage them to jump on the bed, otherwise why than a trampoline. But it's natural for children. They know if they jump up or down, they're actually counteracting or they're using the tonic labyrinth reflex to integrate the bottom and the top part of the brain and the body. When they climb and they, they swing, but with joy, that means it enables them to develop the vestibular system in a fun, and a, a playful manner. You see, the brain wires in one of two ways, either through repetition or highly intense experience, because you don't need a lot if there's a highly intense experience, like birth, has a massive impact on the myelination of our sensory motor system. But when we combine repetition 
with fun. We up the intensity of this experience and they want to do it more. And in that way, we enable the reflexes to do their job a bit quicker um, in a more playful and a child-friendly way, which then enables those reflexes to myelinate, do their job, go to rest, and then free the cortex, the emotional part of the brain and the cortex. It frees those parts of the brain for the child to feel confident, happy, healthy, and then it's so much easier to make friends, and then it's definitely much easier to concentrate. So you see, we're not talking about concentration much tonight, but obviously, as long as there's a primitive reflex active, it holds the child in, um, in a reflexive state. They lack the fundamental control over their physical body. So concentration and attention is always divided. First goal on brain attention is always the safety of the physical body. So if they are aberrant or still active, intrauterine or primitive reflexes, they're going to take an enormous amount of brain energy, um, attention and concentration to help them with a physical component of the work. And then it's very difficult for them to know what they're reading or to know what they're writing because they are so focused on just getting that writing right and ready. As I said earlier, at the Mindness Institute, whatever we spoke about in terms of children, infants and children today is equally applicable to adults and to even to the elderly. And that's why a, another fun way of stimulating the gravitational receptors under the feet, because that's necessary for optimal development of the vestibular system, is to roll a, a tennis ball or a small ball under the ball of, of the feet, forwards, backwards. Um, you can do circular movements to the left, to the right, but it activates those gravitational receptors that exhilarates the development of the vestibular system. You can do this at any age. At the, um, our senior mindfulness program, we've um, done a research study with, with re the elderly, and they unanimously confirmed that they slept better, their levels of anxiety was lower, and their sense of balance improved. It was one of the things with the elderly is the fear of falling. And there are a variety of mind moves, and I'll send you links if you want to, and that you can do. We find this incredibly helpful at the Mind Moves Institute. We, it's actually mimicking the birth process, firmly tracing the outline of the body. And when you get down to the feet, I don't know if you can see the cursor moving. If you get down to the feet, it's obviously not wearing shoes, it's barefooted. You plant those feet to activate those gravitational receptors so they can speak to the, the vestibular system. And then that automatically organizes, or well, gives you a sense of safety and security, and therefore the clarity of thought is automatically enhanced. A second mind move is when you move your arms because anxiety is so closely associated with aberrant, reflexes and specifically the vestibular reflexes anxiety is a huge problem so at the mindless institute we in, encourage children and parents and you to open up your arms wide incidentally it opens up the heart as well that we protect so much with poor posture so it is activating it's mimicking because that's what we do at the mindless institute we mimic infant movements it's what called biomimicry we look at the we look at the movements that all infants universally right over the world, boys, girls, different cultures, different continents, they all mimic the same movements. And that's what they don't mimic. They naturally do that, prompted with a reflex um, system. And we mimic it with older children to enable them um, to, to self-calm and therefore lower anxiety levels to create more balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. You see, mindfulness never competes with any other therapist. It's supportive. Because remember, we are chasing a number of repetitions before a reflex can go to rest. And therapy happens too infrequently. And it's expensive over a long period of time 
that we need to somehow enhance a, a home program to up the repetition and the intensity of experience. So those reflexes can run their course, myelinate and then integrate so the child can gain fundamental and the adult fundamental control over their physical body. There's a variety of other movements that are closely related to specifically muscle tone of the muscles associated with the, um, the movement of the eyes. But that is not very helpful to work on the eyes if the base or underlying sensory motor systems aren't in place. I hope you, you've found this interesting, love to say fascinating, but I love every moment of the support that we are able to give to parents, pregnant parents, the development of infants, whether they are seen, whether they have low vision. We so often use our eyes to compensate for an immature vestibular system and therefore we impair the ability of the eyes to do their job optimally. I thank you. Thank you, Melody. That was superb. That was fascinating. Um, Kay, there are quite a few questions. Yeah, they, 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 they've been piling up all the way through. So let me start quickly at the beginning. Skulk says, is it clinically significant if the baby is very hairy at birth? Um, it would be. Um, one needs to check the presence of vernix because normally a hairy baby indicates that the baby was born premature. There may be exceptions, but the general gist is it indicates prematurity. And then Tegan says, is it common to see primitive reflexes in children with autoimmune disease? And should we encourage these reflex patterns? It's outside of my field of expertise, but it would make absolute sense because when the primitive reflexes and the intrauterine ones that didn't go to rest keep on triggering, you have to consciously try to override them to be able to be functional. It can exhaust the, the system. Great, yes, I could imagine. And then Petro says, great talk once again. Where can we read more about the reappearance of primitive reflexes as a result of emotional stress? I have never written about it, but I am sure um, there must be some research that indicates that specifically. The books that I've written on um, the reflex system um, alludes to it a little bit, but it's not specific to, to that topic. Okay, thank you. And then Maureen says, what is your take on the integration of primitive reflexes? Do you exercise where you repeat the same pattern of the reflex, let's say the ATNR, over and over until it sleeps, or do you exercise opposite to the pattern of the reflex in order to integrate it? The fantastic question. My understanding is the reflex is designed to build a very specific pathway, and that's why it's encouraged that you need to repeat that specific pattern. Remember, the primitive reflex is an automatic stereotype movement. It's stereotype. So if you move out of that type, you're not enabling that reflex to do its job to go to rest. What can sometimes assist is, for example, like the previous talk, adjustments can assist, um, laser can assist, but it is, it's a process that takes time. And you know, nobody knows exactly how many repetitions are necessary for that pathway to myelinate to go to rest. So you never know with a client, are they say it's a thousand? You never know, are they on 223 repetitions or are they on 970? Because if they are 970, you're going to integrate it much easier with just repeating the, the physical movement. But it's a process. It's not an overnight thing because you need the intensity of the development of that pathway to myelinate to go to rest. So the opposite way of thinking about 
um, primitive reflexes is that, that they are pests that we need to get rid of. They're not. They serve a vital and um, develop neurological developmental um, purpose. Yes, thank you so much. That, that is very, very interesting. And then Claudia says, can I please have the exercises as I think it will be really helpful? Um, I'll, Belinda, if it's okay, I will send you an article with and links to all the, the exercises because I just pointed them. We didn't really go through them. If you want to share them with a the group. I see that Chantelle has been posting. Well, yes. yeah. Yeah. Said, but if you'll send them to us, yeah. then I'll attach yeah. them to the webinar when it goes out next week. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yolanda says, thank you for an informative lesson on the vestibular system and the connection to our feet. Catherine wants to ask two questions. She's in the UK, so if that's okay. Jeanette says, it was so wonderful and exciting. I can see some of these issues in patients with brain injuries. I will definitely make sure to learn more about this. And where can I read more about dyslexia in space? Um, Belinda, maybe we can also give them links to, or, or just the titles of the books. Yes. If there's that gravity, that, um, a missing link in child development is really helpful in, in that regard. Great. And then Maureen also says, thank you. The reason I'm asking that particular question is that programs mimic while others work in opposition to the pattern. And then dozens and dozens of thank yous. They, they're coming left, right and center. Wow, thank you was incredibly informative and so interesting from Josie. But there have been many, many, many thank yous. Thank okay, you. so um, I've allowed Catherine to talk. Um, sorry, so Zoom uh, makes me register with Catherine, but it's Siobhan. Um, but I think B and Karen, you probably know that. <laughs> so, um, Melody, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, Melody, I am a midwife um, working in both high and low risk environments in the UK. Um, and I had a comment and then two follow-up questions. So the first comment was just, um, I really found what you were saying about the benefits of uh, vaginal birth on the vestibular system. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and just an observation from me is, is that I, I, those, those early reflexes, baby's early response, you know, all of the, sort of the skin to skin and feeding with a vaginal birth, um, I feel like they, they happen a little bit faster. Um, I'd say sort of medium sort of speed with an emergency section where a baby has been subjected to, to contractions, um, but not so much. I feel like everything is slightly delayed and takes just that much longer with, a, uh, with an elective section. Um, so I was just curious about the role of contractions. Um, so not, not just on baby's head, but just, you know, sort of, sort of all, all on the, uh, sort of all over baby's skin and, and their, um, uh, yeah, on, on the whole system. But following the birth of a baby, um, you know, I try to do as much skin to skin as possible, um, you know, a minimum of an hour. If, if we can get to sort of two or even three hours, that is that is sort of the absolute best. Um, what I'm curious about is at some stage, we do need to take baby in order to do that top to toe check to make sure that baby is OK. And is there, in your opinion, any benefit to baby being placed in a supine or prone position when we start that process. Historically, they've always been supine, but recently there's been a bit of a move to babies being put in a prone flat position first. And I, and I wondered if you had any thoughts or advice on that. Oh, Siobhan, that is fascinating. Okay, so if, if I use biomimicry as a guide, um, if you look at the baby, um, a newborn infant, it is instinct for both infant and mom to be in a in a prone position. But it, it depends on the extent of the whatever you need to look at. Obviously, there might be a reason why you need to, to turn them so they're more supine and ideally on mom's chest. In the ideal world, the environment so, is... Sorry, 
So, so it's not a, so initially. Uh, yes, I agree. Definitely prone on mum's chest. Um, you know, completely uninterrupted. It's more when we then take baby to weigh baby, um, you know, put labels on, um, you know, do a, a full body map, sort of th- those actions. It, is there any benefit or at that stage is being prone and having that skin to skin, have all those processes um, taken place and so it doesn't really matter? <clears throat> Chances are excellent when they're in a supine position that they are going to a startle response. So my instinctive response would be that prone would always be more comforting. But I would strongly recommend, if you're not following the work of Michelle Oudar at the moment, um, he's in the UK, um, superb, superb guidance, absolutely um, um, science-based, intervention. So please look at the work of work of Michelle um, Odent as O-D-E-N-T, Michelle O'Dell, superb. Yes, no, I, I, I know Michelle well. Um, um, my, just another question, sort of, uh, uh, I was really interested in what you were saying about the benefits of being on a flat surface. Uh, and quite commonly, early on in the postnatal period, um, you know, we find that babies just do not want to be in a cot. We know that they want to be with mum. Um, and there's a lot at the moment around co-sleeping and how co-sleeping is not advisable. Um, and I just wondered when you were talking about babies having that experience of being in a, on a, in a flat position or on a flat surface, is there any guidance around length of time? Should they be sleeping in that position? You know, is it for, you know, we, we used to talk, I mean, I don't, we don't really talk about this so much anymore, but we used to say, you know, a prone position for 20 minutes a day for hip and neck development. Um, but, but is there any, any guidance on that? Um, again, Siobhan, I would always caution to flat surface away from mom, especially, you know, with SIDS. There's been such a, a body of research that indicates that front, um, supine position is better for babies when they lie down. And if I say flat, mom's chest is not completely flat, but that's a stunning surface to lie on, not to sleep on, but to lie on. So you need to work with what is practical in the environment. But um, if a baby is taught or given the opportunity to lie um, um, prone on mom's chest, on dad's chest as well. So it's a completely different um, sensory environment. It automatically creates a positive association with the uh, prone position, which makes it easy for them to lie on a flat surface at a later stage. So if we talk about age, a baby, newborn baby, mom's chest, the best um, flat surface, dad's chest, a flat surface. And in time, um, on, a, on a flat surface, like an um, infant cot or bed or, or something like that. Um, Siobhan, I just want to come back to what you previously asked about taking the baby away to measure and, and label and all of that stuff. Just double check the, the prime time for imprinting, because you don't want to interrupt that. Because the way in the baby's way, it's not going to change too much a little bit later. If there's a medical condition, you'll see it immediately and you automatically address it immediately. But I think there's routinely an interruption of that imprinting time when baby needs to not be separated from mom, that we just need to. But Michelle Oudar is the best person to ask about that. Melody, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I am. Uh, I, I have had not quite, but close to stand-up arguments with uh, coordinators where I've, they say I've not done my work, but it's where I've just left mum and babies um, because I can see that baby hasn't finished that cycle. Um, you know, yeah. they haven't gone into that process of sleep. Yeah. Um, and until that happens, uh, what I'm also really pleased to say is, you know, I don't know what's happening globally, but I think there's been a lot of work done in the UK um, where, you know, if that process is interrupted for any reason, we now have to document the rationale for why that happened. Um, and I, I think it's really exciting, and I'm 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 hoping that it's going to start having a real change on on 
you know, mums and babies physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, sort of all, all, all the all the areas. Please feel um, that and we, we, as strongly as you can. Uh, no, really very much. In the so. best interest of that baby, that baby's brain, and the future. We're we're also really moving to. Um, as much of a baby check as possible should be done skin to skin with mum. You know, if you are, gosh, you know, if you need to take a baby's heart rate or, or check their temperature, you do not need to separate them from their mum at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, do, doing that, doing that a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And excitingly, what we're starting to see as well is a lot of, you know, we've had skin to skin in theatre for a long time, but. If for any reason mum is not able to to do that skin to skin, we're seeing a lot of skin to skin with dads in theatre, yeah. and that trend I think is definitely picking up. So hurrah, happy news! And that's <laughs> absolutely stunning. And Shavon, the other thing is as well with we, we're talking about physiological birth now, but when a baby is born by Caesar, there is no reason for that baby not to to have skin on skin. So so if there's a different way of birth, the the our experience at the baby gym, our baby gym program, as is as as quickly as possible to revert back to what is the natural way that things normally unfold. Those babies really benefit from that, and um, yeah, we can talk about the baby, the whole baby thing, another time, because there's a lot more to be said. There, there's so much. I will just say, Melody, that um, I think interestingly. A, a group of people who've been behind skin to skin in theatre more than most, funny enough, has been anaesthetists. Yeah. Um, they, they've just been absolutely instrumental in driving it. There must have been something at a conference that was presented to them because, you know, it was it was almost in the space of like three or four months where they all just became incredibly supportive of it. So, it's you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much... Anyway, Melody, I can talk about this for hours, so let me let okay, someone else <laughs> They need this thing to have their eyes on monitors, don't they? So they see the numbers and they see how the numbers change when the baby does um, skin on skin time. So they're there. It's evidence based research. And that there probably was a conference as well. Thank you for the questions and the comments. Marvelous. Thank you. And that, that's the end of the questions. And there are about 42 extra thank yous. Well, but I won't read them all out. <laughs> Lady, that was superb. Thank you, thank you so much. much. Um, and I'm sure that what we will have to start looking at is integrating with some courses somewhere along the line. So we'll speak about that in due course. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thanks so much, Melody. Bye. Thank you.